Our next presenter is uh, John Clays. All I'll say about him is that uh, I, with all this COVID stuff, I've been starting uh, doing some stuff on Zoom. And every now and then I'll get a question about the last day's eschatology. And I always give them the same answer. I said, I don't know, email John Clays and ask him. He'll tell you the answer. So we uh, very much appreciate John uh, being here. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you, Ken. Great to be here. What a privilege. Can't follow those speakers, but what a privilege to be here anyway. Um, toward the end of the 19th century, Swedish chemist Alfred Nobel awoke one morning to read his own obituary in a local newspaper. That's right. Read his own obituary in the local newspaper, and here was his obituary. Alfred Nobel, the inventor of dynamite, who died yesterday, devised a way for more people to be killed in a war than ever before, and he died a very rich man. The only problem, it wasn't he who died, it was his older brother who had died. The newspaper reporter had bungled the epitaph. But the occasion... The, the account had a very profound effect on Nobel. He decided he wanted to be known for something other than uh, devising a, a, a way to kill more people efficiently and for amassing a fortune in the process. So he initiated the Nobel Prize, the award given to uh, writers and uh, scientists who foster peace. Nobel stated this, every man ought to have a chance to correct his own epitaph in midstream and write a new one. You know, few things will, or at least should, change us as much as looking at life as though it is finished. I almost had an opportunity to do that about a week ago when I was hit by an 18-wheeler on I-20. Uh, it was an exciting rush of adrenaline. <laughs> and it was truly a miracle, I believe, that I was able to walk away from that. But I think that can be life-changing. However, the Bible presents a very solemn scene in which an innumerable amount of people are gathered together and who literally view their lives as finished. Yet surprisingly, they exhibit no change. Instead, they all stubbornly hang on to the very thinking that has re resulted in them facing an eternity away from the presence of the Lord. The scene I'm describing is called the Great White Throne Judgment. And it's found in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15. Now, to put this in chronological perspective, a thousand years before the great white throne judgment will be the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus returns to the earth, he'll destroy his enemies. These are the armies of the world that are gathered together, according to Revelation 16. They gather together in northern Israel. They come down the Kidron stream, down the Kidron Valley, and the effort by Satan in gathering them there is to try to cut off Jesus when Satan knows Jesus is coming to the Mount of Olives. Satan knows he's going to have to cross the Kidron Valley to ascend the Temple Mount to sit on the Davidic throne to begin his kingdom rule. So he gathers this innumerable amount of people together to war against him. He destroys them uh, very efficiently. And then he casts the beast and the false prophet alive into the lake of fire, the only two unbelievers who never have an opportunity to actually come before the great white throne judgment. That is all followed, I believe, by two judgments. Uh, the first of those is the judgment of the nations found in Matthew 25, th verses 31 to 46. Or we might call it the judgment of the sheep of goats, sheep and goats. And I believe that is followed by the judgment seat of Christ in which all believers will assemble and be assessed based on 
how we've done with what we have been given. Then Jesus initiates his kingdom rule upon the earth, which we call the millennial kingdom because he's going to rule for a thousand years. During that time, Satan is bound. But at the very end of that period, Satan is released for a short time to deceive the nations to invade Israel. Satan is then cast into the lake of fire and the great white throne judgment is convened as all unbelievers from all history are assembled before him. So here we have a little encapsulation. The return of Jesus, the judgment of the sheep and goats, the judgment of the Bema or the judgment seat of Christ, the millennial kingdom, and then the great white throne judgment. Now all these unbelievers are gathered together in the courtroom of the awesome and dreaded judge and we see that coming forth in this initial description of that judgment. Then I, the Apostle John who wrote this passage, then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. Now the throne is called great um, Greek word megos, John, that's one of John's favorite adjectives in Revelation. He uses it 60 times. And uh, that is followed by the word white, which Lucas, which he uses 17 times. According to Robert Mounts, this great conveys the grandeur of its authority, while white portrays the presence of the glory of God. I have no argument with that uh, definition. <laughs> Jesus will grant a hearing to all unbelievers except for the beast and the false prophet. And that shows how evil and wicked those two are because they don't even get to offer a hearing before the judge. But the dread will be intense. From his presence, the earth and the heaven fled away. It's, uh, it's kind of an anthropomorphism of uh, unbelievers try to flee from the presence of Jesus as he convenes his, his judgment, but there is no escape. And I saw the dead, John continues, Necros, small and great, standing before the throne. I believe John is using this term dead in the sense of spiritual dead, not physical, because they've been resurrected to come before this judgment. So spiritually, I mean, physically they're resurrected, spiritually they're dead. John uses this term a couple of other times in the same way, such as in John chapter 5, verse 25, where Jesus announces, Most assuredly I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead, the necros, the spiritually dead, will hear the voice of of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. In other words, those who believe his message will have spiritual life. John also uses it in uh, chapter 20. Faithful believers, according to verse 4, will rule during the millennial kingdom, the thousand year reign of Christ. That's part of the first resurrection. But the rest of the dead, verse 5, the necros, did not live again until the thousand years were finished. The rest, the dead, the spiritually dead, these are the unbelievers who a thousand years after uh, the um, millennia, uh, after, a thousand years after the initiation of the millennial kingdom, uh, they will come back to physical life to appear before the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, chapter 11 verses, I'm sorry, chapter 20, verses 11 to 15, that's the passage where we find the great white throne judgment. It actually connects back to verses 4 and 5 to show what happens to the rest of the dead. Here they are now. They did not have a part in the first resurrection. That is, they're not believers in Jesus Christ. Anyone who has believed in Jesus for eternal life will be in the first resurrection. These of course will not. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. Small and great is a merism, meaning from the, the tiniest to the greatest to the, the least noticed to the most powerful and everybody in between. No one will be left out. All unbelievers will appear before this great white throne. 
John continues by saying, the sea gave up the dead, the necros who were in it, and death and Hades, Hades is the holding place currently for unbelievers until they appear before the judge at this great white throne judgment, delivered up the dead who were in them. Not even the sea or death or Hades will be able to shield any unbeliever from this fearful and final judgment. All unbelievers, if you haven't grasped that already, all unbelievers who have ever lived will appear at this judgment with the exception of the beast and the false prophet. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. The first death describes the spiritual state of all unbelievers who will be appearing before the Lord Jesus at this judgment. The second death of uh, portrays their eternal separation, their eternal experience separated from the very life of God forever. I can't imagine anything more uh, awful, more hopeless than that. Sin brought death to mankind according to Romans 5, and we can read that throughout Scripture. Those who never believe in Jesus for eternal life will die in their sins. Jesus indicated that in John chapter 8, verses 21 and 24, when he spoke that to the religious leaders who were avidly against him. Uh, no matter what signs they saw him perform, they determined they were going to get rid of him. And he told them they will die in their sins. However, as Zane Hodges pointed out, since Christ effectively died for the sins of the entire world, nobody goes to hell for their sins. Just take that in for a second, because I know that we've been taught much differently by others in the past. Since Christ effectively died for the sins of the entire world, nobody goes to hell for their sins. They go to hell because they do not have eternal life. This is confirmed by the biblical account of the final judgment found in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15. Well, where do we see it? Sin is not even mentioned at this great white throne judgment, not once. Now, while unbelievers will die in their sins, they will not be in the lake of fire because of their sins. No mention of sin at the great white throne judgment. This non-mention of sin, I believe, would be more than a neglectful omission by the apostle if he were trying to communicate that sin was the cause of sending people to hell. If he was trying to communicate that sin sends people to hell, he did a very poor job in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 to 15, because he never mentions sin. The absence of any mention of sin at this judgment underlies the truth that where one spends eternity has absolutely nothing to do with anything one does, whether it be good or bad. Unbelievers will dwell in the lake of fire because their names are not found in the book of life. Now, however, the great white throne judgment does mention men's works and books were opened and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. And they were judged, each one according to his works. So that's very clear. They're being judged according to their works, but not according to their sins. Two sets of books are displayed. There are books, plural, as you can see. Those are the books of works, of their works. And then there's the book singular, which is, of course, the book of life. They're judged according to their works. And I believe there are two possible meanings to this. I believe both are correct. How's that for being political? I'm not going to take sides on this. I do think both meanings are correct. The first meaning, uh, what does it mean to be judged according to their works, is that Jesus will demonstrate at this judgment 
that the works of unbelievers will fall infinitely short of meeting God's perfect standard for entrance into his kingdom. I think that's going to be very evident. They're going to be there trying to argue that they should that he should let them into God's kingdom because of some of the great things that they, that they have done. We'll see that in a moment. Supreme Court Justice Horace Gray once said to a man who appeared before him at a lower court, I know you are guilty and you know it. I wish you to remember that one day you will stand before a better and wiser judge who will deal with you according to justice and not according to the law. And that's what's going to happen at the great white throne judgment. This judge who is the perfect judge will deal with them according to justice. And if they want to try to get in based on their works, he's going to demonstrate their works fall infinitely short of God's perfect standard to entrance into the kingdom. Justice Gray was right. God will deal with every man according to his perfect justice. Jesus will demonstrate, first of all, that the works of unbelievers fall infinitely short of God's perfect standard for kingdom entrance. I believe there's a second way to understand this, and I would agree with this uh, understanding as well. Judged according to their works relates to differing eternal experiences for all people. Now, in the presentations we've heard already this morning, we have heard about um, the judgment seat of Christ, where all believers in Jesus will appear, will be assessed according to our works. The very fact that we're at that judgment means that we have believed in Jesus for eternal life. Our names are in the book of life. And so we don't appear at that assessment in order to find out if we're in the kingdom. We're already guaranteed kingdom entrance at the moment we have believed Jesus for his offer of eternal life. We're at that judgment to be assessed to our eternal experience, singular, I agree with Bob Bryant's great presentation this morning, it's a singular experience of reward. But all people are going to be judged based on their works, not just believers, unbelievers as well. Let's look at a comparison contrast between believers and unbelievers regarding their eternal experiences. The Bema, which is another term for the judgment seat of Christ, shows that all believers will be judged according to their works to determine not where they will spend eternity, but how they spend eternity, i.e. the quality of their eternal experience. All believers will reside in God's kingdom. That is the where of their experience. However, some believers will be rewarded with a richer experience in God's kingdom. That is the how of their eternal experience. Unbelievers will reside in the lake of fire. That is the where of their eternal experience. They'll have differing recompenses that's sort of like believers have rewards, they'll have recompenses in the lake of fire. That expresses the how of their eternal experience. Both the where and the how of their eternal experience will be demonstrated at the great white throne judgment. Where one experiences eternity depends on whether one has believed in Jesus alone for eternal life. How one experiences eternity depends on how one has behaved or lived in regard to God's Word. Believers and unbelievers, how have they responded in terms of God's Word? All unbelievers will be separated from God, but the nature of each unbeliever's experience in the lake of fire will differ from one another, and that experience is determined by their works. Their works refer to how they lived in regard to God's Word. Now, whether they believe God's Word or not, it matters not. That's God's standard. And whether it's a believer or unbeliever, you go against God's standard, there are consequences for that. So, for example, Jesus declared that some unbelievers will suffer a greater condemnation than other unbelievers. And I've listed some passages, Matthew 10, 15, 11, 22, etc. 
Um, it's clear that Jesus expressed that over and over in the Gospels. Paul declared in Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. And I believe that's a general statement that applies to believers and unbelievers alike. God is not mocked either by believers or unbelievers. Whatever a man sows, that he will reap. Yet, some of the wicked here and now in what we call this life seem to get away with their wickedness and even prosper in this life. That's what the author of Psalm 73 clearly expresses. But one day at the great white throne judgment, all unbelievers will be judged according to their works and God's justice will be dispensed perfectly. If I could take just a second, go, go ahead, be at, be at ease, be at your business. Ah, thank you. All people, believers and unbelievers alike, will be judged according to their works. Here are some, uh, just a few sprinkling of verses that indicate that. Psalm 62, 12. For you, the Lord, render to each one according to his work. That's a general statement to all mankind. Proverbs 24, 12. Does not he who weighs the hearts consider it? He who keeps your soul, does he not know it? In other words, nothing escapes God's attention. And will he not render to each one, each man, according to his deeds? The answer, of course, is yes, he will. Ecclesiastes 12, 14, for God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. I, the Lord, Jeremiah 17, 10, I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. I think we, I think we can see it's quite clear. God will judge every individual according to his or her works. Now, in the vast throng at the great white throne judgment, there will be individuals assembled from the small and the great. They'll be from the apparently moral individual to the most heinously wicked individual. People such as Adolf Hitler, Idi Amin, Joseph Stalin. I'm not saying that Adolf Hitler, Idi Amin, and Joseph Stalin are necessarily going to be at that judgment. I mean, if I hold to a true free grace theology, if sometime before they died, they believed in Jesus for eternal life, they will be with us at the judgment seat of Christ uh, entering into the kingdom. But let's say people like that uh, will be appearing at the great white throne judgment. Among them will be considered good men, such as good Joe, Joe Goodneighbor. Uh, Joe Goodneighbor, nice moral man, maybe even went to church a lot, was a faithful husband, good to those around him, but he never saw the need to believe in Jesus for eternal life. He just felt his works were going to be good enough to get him into the kingdom. The same where? Yes. Same destiny in terms of where they spend eternity. The same how? No. Absolutely not. Jesus as judge will give unbelievers the opportunity to argue their cases. That's an amazing thing. Uh, for example, Jesus points this out, I believe, in Matthew 7, verses 22 and 23, when he says, many will say to me in that day, I believe that day is the day of the great white throne judgment, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name, here are the charismatic unbelievers appearing before Jesus, and Jesus says, I'm sorry, I don't mean to offend you if you're charismatic. Jesus, uh, believing charismatics are going to be at the judgment seat of Christ. But <laughs> Jesus responds, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. There, but he gives them the opportunity to argue their cases. That's what a courtroom is about. The person on trial has the opportunity to argue his or her case before the judge. Others such as Israelite unbelievers during the first advent, Jews who lived in Israel while Jesus 
was ministering in Israel will, will present their case in this way. This is from Luke 13, 26. We ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. In other words, we have a connection with you. Jesus' response will be, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. As a result of this banishment, going back to Revelation 20, verses 14 and 15, then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. These verses are the climax of the passage. In fact, one restates the other. To dramatize and emphasize the finality of this judgment, verse 15 actually is restating verse 14. Then death and Hades were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. All unbelievers are then banished to the lake of fire. Because they did not possess the life of God, they'll be eternally separated from the giver of life. By contrasting the books of works with the book of life, John declares where one spends eternity has nothing to do with one's works and everything to do with the presence or absence of one's name in the book of life. So, how is one's name ascribed to the book of life? I'm glad you asked. Good question. John tells us, I believe, in the purpose statement of the Gospel of John, here's what he says in John 20, 31. These the signs recorded in the Gospel of John. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, which is the giver of eternal life, the Son of God, the one who has the authority to give that life, and that believing you have life in His name. Those who receive God's life, and throughout the Gospel of John, that offer is given by Jesus over and over again. Eternal life is a promise. We receive it by believing Him for it. Those who receive God's life by believing Jesus for it are those whose names are in the book of life. So what do we learn from the great white throne judgment? I'm glad you asked that too. You're full of good questions. One, the great white throne judgment is not about sin. It is about unbelief and works. Unbelief determines where the judge, the judged, spend eternity. Their works determine the how of their experience in the lake of fire. And let me just say this, and, and um, it would have to be another presentation to argue this point, but let me just throw it out there because controversy is just so much fun here. Um, I believe that these unbelievers never, ever, ever get it. They will never get it. And if you look at an illustration in Luke 16, uh, where the, you've got Jesus telling the story, I believe a true story about a rich man and Lazarus who died, and um, the, uh, you know, they end up in two different areas. At that time, Hades contained believers and unbelievers, but there was a paradise section, and there was a torment section. There was a uh, Smoking section, non-smoking section, something like that. But anyway, so the rich man could see Abraham and Lazarus across this great gulf. Well, they interact, and finally he says to Abraham, he asks Abraham to send Lazarus back from the dead to warn his five brothers so they would not end up in the same place. And, and Abraham says... No, they have Moses and the Scriptures, and if they hear them. In other words, they have the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament. And if they're truly open, they will believe those, and they will end up believing in Jesus for eternal life, is what Abraham is getting across, I believe. And Jesus points this out in John 5.39 when He says to the religious leaders, you search the Scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life, and they speak of Me. So if they were open to those Old Testament Scriptures, they would believe. And, the, and so the rich man responds with, oh no, Abraham, if somebody would come back from the dead, then they would repent. Notice the word that he uses. He believed in repentance, and he's in hell. What does that tell us? 
Um, and Abraham subtly corrects him by saying, uh, no, even if, so, if they don't believe Moses in the scriptures, even if somebody were to come back from the dead, they would not be persuaded, synonym for believe. The rich man never got it. He's still thinking, you got to repent, you got to do works, you've got to, <clears throat> I don't think they ever get it. These at the great white throne judgment still don't get it. They're still trying to argue their way into the kingdom by their works and by their association with Jesus that they never had. Here's the application of that first point. We are to invite unbelievers to believe Jesus for eternal life. The gospel is not believing Jesus to forgive sins, which he does. It's not believing Jesus to remove sins, which in a sense he's already propitiated our sins, and not only ours, but 1 John 2, 2 says those of the whole world. He's already propitiated sin. We're not believing him to do that. He's already done that. We are to believe Jesus for eternal life, and not even believing Jesus died for our sins. Just real quickly, I can tell you that by experience. I grew up Roman Catholic. Um, I believed Jesus died for my sins. I believed He was the Son of God, but I was trying to work my way to heaven. I did not have eternal life until I became a junior in college, and somebody through a few different people and some things that I read, I finally got it that I need to believe in Jesus alone for eternal life. But I believe the right things, right? I believe Jesus died for my sins. I did not have eternal life. We need to offer unbelievers the offer Jesus offers in the Gospel of John. Eternal life by simply believing Him for it. Or you can call it believe in Him for your way to heaven. Believe in Him for being with God forever. However you want to put it. But that's the offer and one believes Jesus for it, he or she has it. Second thing we learn from the great white throne judgment is God's justice will be perfectly demonstrated. The Lord will justly assign eternal experiences of individuals based on their works. And you know, for me, if the more I understand that concept, the more I'm not as bothered by not seeing justice here and now. Now, I think each one of us is created to see justice. That's why we get frustrated when we see the wicked getting away and prospering. We can see that in a lot of areas today in the political realm or whatever. But it doesn't bother me as much when I know, hey, their time is coming, my time's coming. So <laughs> in, terms of the great, in terms of the judgment seat of Christ... So I'm not as bothered because I know God will in His perfect timing and at the great white throne ju judgment, His justice will be perfectly demonstrated. What do we also learn? Three, third thing, contextually, the great white throne judgment prepares for a new creation without sin. As part of sweeping away all sin, uh, sinfulness, all unbelievers will be cast into the lake of fire. Then God will destroy the current cosmos, the current universe, create a new.